Welcome everybody, my name is Ricardo Vinuesa, I'm an associate professor at KTH in Stockholm and today we're going to continue with our machine learning course uh, focusing more on compressed sensing, a whole new a chapter and a number of sections that I hope will be very interesting and very exciting. So let me start by uh, introducing the second chapter. This is chapter number two. We're going to look at sparsity and also comprehensive sensing. So we're going to learn uh, about compression methods and possibilities to be able to optimally sample from an array of data, uh, which usually is high dimensional, and that we can try to give also some sort of physical interpretation that can be uh, helpful for us. So let's start with some motivation. Let's consider a picture, that's something that we are familiar with, that we are storing in our phones with different levels of fidelity and resolution, and let's see how we can work with that uh, in terms of sensing and sampling. So if we think of a motivation for this, okay, uh, let's look at, let us consider a high dimensional data set. And this can be, for example, an image. Okay, and let's try to understand this problem as follows. So let's find some space. We think of a, a nice sunset here. I'm sure that this summer many have uh, recollected this in their phones, right? So we think of a nice sunset, and this is our high dimensional data. Okay, now let's uh, think of a way to hopefully transform this uh, image in, in, a, in some manner that can be efficient for us, that can be helpful for us. So let's try to transform it. And let's try to come up with some efficient representation of this high dimensional image. So, efficient representation. And to obtain a, a new representation, we need a set of coordinates. So we're going to find a set of coordinates that can be uh, helping us to represent the same data, but in a more compact way. That's a little bit what we're trying to look for here. And to do this, the SVD chapter that we just covered in the previous series is going to be very helpful. It's all about finding the right coordinates such that the data, which can be high dimensional, it can be complex, it can be sometimes difficult to understand, it can be then understood in a new perspective, eh, in a new set of coordinates, which can help hopefully shed some light into the problem that we want to understand. So, uh, the efficient representation in new coordinates. And once we obtain this new representation, we want to truncate, we want to be able to compress so that we can uh, not only express the information in a more efficient way, but then we want to really uh, retain only the most important pieces of information so we can hopefully save some, some storage. So we are going to do some truncation. After we do the truncation, we end up with basically a, a reduced dimensional uh, version of the same data. So a low rank or low dimensional approximation. 
And if you remember, when we talked about the SPD, uh, we did a lot of uh, steps which did not involve any uh, approximation, right? You think of the economy SPD versus the full SPD. In the economy SPD, we were just uh, reducing uh, the, the U matrix and the V matrices uh, in such a way that would retain only the information that is not multiplied by zeros uh, when performing the whole uh, multiplication with the diagonal matrix, with the sigma matrix. But it was still an equal sign. Uh, when we go into the approximation, when we have an approximate sign, is when we uh, start to truncate. So we take uh, the M, Madrid number of columns, when we start to remove more and more columns, that's when the data is not equivalent, that's when we truncate. So that's a little bit the concepts that we need to refresh to be able to use that efficiently in the context of compressing. And now, once we have the low dimensional approximation eh, of the original data, now we want to uh, hopefully reconstruct it in the best possible way and maintain as much energy as possible. This is what we would call here the reconstruction. Okay. Now, he, here we want to ask ourselves one question. Uh, we are storing data, right? Because we want to have the nice sunset and we want to have memories of uh, when it's cold and dark. Uh, we want to remember those moments. Now, do we need the original data? Do we need the whole original data set? That's a little bit what we want to uh, be thinking. Well, let's try to answer that question. Did we need to uh, store the complete original data set. Okay. Let's take an example. It's not going to be high dimensional. We're going to take a small uh, image of 20 pixels by 20 pixels. So if we have a 20 by 20 pixel black and white image, This is a very uh, simplified uh, example, just to, to, to try to illustrate the concept, uh, because in principle we'll have grayscales, we have many uh, possible values that we could get, but if it's black and white, it's only ones or zeros, right? So only two possibilities, and only 20 square pixels. So 20 square data points, which can be only ones or zeros. How many possible images can exist in this very small uh, example? Okay. How many possible images? Well, we have 20 times 20, which is 400 pixels, right? And those pixels can take two values, one or zero. So the number of possible combinations would be 2 raised to the power of 400, right? Which is approximately 2.5 times 10 to the power of 120 possible images. Okay. If we just look at uh, possible values of ones and zeros in that matrix of 20 by 20. Now, obviously, most of these are going to be just noise, uh, garbage, random stuff, right? It's not going to be even anything that is, can be interpreted with any patterns, right? But um, the idea is that if we blindly store all the values, then we need to uh, store a lot of data. If we try to focus on the patterns and the features that are meaningful to the type of data that we're looking at, then we can maybe retain less information and we can still reconstruct most, most of the relevant stuff that we want to be focusing on. So most of this uh, 2.5 times to, uh, 10 to the power of 120 will never represent anything resembling an image. Okay? Most will never represent data. And the useful images are a small subset. Therefore, is there a more efficient way to store the data? to store the data. Well, that's what we want to answer in this chapter, right? That's kind of like the main, the main idea. 
Uh, at the end, let's consider the pixel uh, space, right, of these 20 by 20 uh, possible pixels that we have. So let us express the data in pixel space. Now, what does this mean? Now we're going to take our data matrix X, okay, our fantastic a capital X. This is going to be the sum in A and J of X i J times E i J. Okay, and here I want to um, highlight that this E i J are the basis elements, and this X would be the components, basically. Okay, so I'm just expressing my original data in this uh, basis, eh, which are basically representing me at the pixel space. Now, um, what we want, ideally, is the following. We want to express X, the data matrix, approximately as the sum in K, so a number of, uh, of indices, of SKVK, SK times VK, and here VK is a tensor, where SK are coefficients and we want most of this SK to be zero because that means that I have a very efficient representation of my original data. So we want most to be zero. Okay. And then with VK, what we have is a basis in which the data is sparse. Okay. So that means that uh, that's a more uh, efficient way to represent the data because in that basis, many SK will actually be zero. Okay. So this VK, this would be trying to find, we want a basis, VK, in which the data is sparse. And what does this mean, that the data is sparse? That there are many sk equal to zero. Okay? A typical example, if you look at the classical physics, very basic physics, is the Cartesian frame of reference and the polar frame of reference, right, or the cylindrical frame of reference. When you have, when you learn about uh, mechanics and physics and velocities and accelerations, you do everything in Cartesian coordinates, so uh, streamwise, uh, vertical coordinate, and, and you have to kind of carry over both, uh, and that works a lot of the times when the geometries are kind of simple, but when you start something that uh, has, a, has a cylindrical geometry, then you realize that it might be efficient to talk about radial and asymmetric distances and then suddenly you can express very efficiently and very, in a very compact way the position, velocity and acceleration of your particle without having to resort to this awkward X and Y uh, distribution and just talking about radial distance and angle. It's more elegant and it's much more compact way uh, of really expressing that information. That uh, intuitive thinking is the type of stuff that we want to use in this type of um, of representations uh, for compressed sensing. We want to find a basis VK such that uh, the coefficients uh, are, uh, that are used to express the data in that basis, uh, many of them are zero. And so we can actually simplify uh, significantly the way that the data is being uh, stored. And all of this is what we called compressed sensing. So I just wanted to give you a little introduction, uh, a kind of overview of what we'll be covering in this new series, in this new section about compressed sensing. Uh, we really want to look at data, at real data. We want to really find ways to sense it, to sample it, and to store it efficiently, and then try to get some physical interpretation out of this. So that's all for today's short introduction. Um, that's all we have, so we'll be very happy to discuss more and to get more feedback from you, and then see you next time. Bye.